Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 4, The Dutch Oven, which might be my favorite named episode in the entire <laughs> season, in the entire run of the you show. You would say that. <laughs> <laughs> it originally premiered on October 25th, 1985. It was written by Maurice Hurley, who... We know well Golden Triangle Part 2, and he just did the last one that we watched, too, in Whatever Works. The director was Abel Ferreira. He also directed The Home Invaders. You also might remember us talking about him. If you remember correctly, he also directed a porn titled The Nine Lives of a Wet Pussy. So we got that going for us, too. <laughs> I wonder if they let him name it. Like, that's why it's named Dutch <laughs> I've seen so many, I have to name it this. <laughs> uh, gave my dog a Dutch oven the other night. <laughs> I think that's oversharing. I think that we don't need to hear about that. <laughs> is, is that I what you've so many and questions. Up over? I have so many questions. <laughs> Before we get started, like checking in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, just recently, there was announced that the Ferrari Testarossa that's used in a season we in the in the upcoming seasons we haven't watched yet. The Daytona Testarossa is up for auction again. Now a reminder, this car only has 16,500 miles on it and it sold last time for $2 million. I can only think of one person in this group that was willing to fork over $2 million for the car that Crockett's butt set in. And that would be me. I'm, <laughs> I got the money, I'd buy it right now. <laughs> John, you strike me as someone that would buy like one of those Jurassic Park Jeeps that goes around the park. <laughs> what? You know, I was thinking about it. I, I think I'm more of like a Ghostbusters ambulance guy. Just because I would love the, I would just, I would drive around constantly with, with like the sirens on, playing the music. <laughs> just bust, just dress like a Ghostbuster and then drive around to hotels and just come running in. Like, don't worry. I got it. It's under control. And then just leave. You know, that's a lie because he uh, would totally buy Dawson's Jeep from Dawson's Creek. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, we finally got a Trudy episode. It's This whole story is just about Trudy, and I think we can all agree it's about damn time. Yes, it is. I know. What's a girl got to do to get some love from the uh, directors, I mean, <laughs> and, and the writers? <laughs> Up until this point, her role has been handing pieces of paper to Crockett. <laughs> Or, or being part of the shootout when they like the Miami Vice team lines up on top of a house and just murders an entire gang. That is true. Like they, uh, they're always part of the shootouts. Like at one point during the shootout, Gina and Trudy just pop out and start firing too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's hurry up and get into and break down this episode, which I think we can all agree this is it's a pretty solid episode. All right, guys, this was a classic Miami Vice open. We have fast-paced music we have quintessential 80s things happening and it all begins with trudy doing her makeup because she's a backup dancer for jim and the holograms <laughs> she wishes <laughs> she didn't have no magic earring on i looked i don't know but my initial thought was man this is kind of hot like, uh, like with the whole wig and the face painting and stuff like I just, I fully expected her because they were going to Club Dynamo that then she was going to go up on stage and play the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, what's happening is that they're doing a bust inside of the club. And of course, instead of it being cool, like Trudy dressing up like one of the holograms and going up on stage, she's doing one of the worst stuff, which is pretending to be a hooker outside of a club. Her and Gina both were dressed like hookers and pretending to be hookers. The, the whole Vice team is there. Can I say this too? Not to create too much of a ruckus in the room, but um, <laughs> I think Tub is, is uh, better dressed than Crockett is. And I'm, uh, like He's looking pretty smooth in that suit too. He's clean. He he always dresses clean. Crockett's is more takes more risks, I guess you could say. But Tubbs yeah, is always I like just, he's always clean in that suit. Yeah, I guess I agree. coming yeah. into the show, I, I always heard coming into the show how much of a big deal. I mean, how much people had a crush on Don Johnson, and I'm surprised that I I, I think Tubbs is a better dresser than Crockett is. But he's too sweaty, so <laughs> you can't like him. <laughs> That's why he wasn't the sex symbol. He was too sweaty for everybody. <laughs> 
every suit just got pit stains all over it. Like. Exactly. <laughs> Meanwhile, Crockett just glistens a little bit. He's not all sweaty. He's just a little moist. <laughs> this is like a sting that they're doing. So the whole vice team is working. Switek and Tubbs go inside. There's a little kerfuffle, and Switek <laughs> can't go with Tubbs. And so Tubbs only wants to, to go back. They're going to make a buy. They make a big buy. They have some cash. They're going to bust down this. But when they get in there, turns out that Someone else kind of knew about the deal, I guess, and is robbing the drugs and the money and is going to take off out the door. And they're able to successfully do that against Tubbs. But, of course, radios get around. Everyone on the vice team knows. And so when the bad guy comes running out and Trudy's out there with Crockett, Camaro, that the guy who set up this, I guess it's like. So, it's actually it's a firebird. <laughs> and so, yeah, Bill and Ted rob the cops. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I, it looks like like two Firebirds get away, but then uh, uh, eventually Crockett chases them down, and it's only one. Yeah, and there's only one person in the car, so maybe two of them did drive away, but they only chase after one of them. So I guess they guessed right on which one had the cash. Well, what a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Trudy hops in the Ferrari with Crockett. Crockett takes off after, we'll call him Bill. Takes off after Bill as they go <laughs> driving around Miami, and you see, you get a lot of slow mo shots of Trudy, who looks like she's totally out of her element. This she's is, terrified. She's like, she can't move. She's I frozen. Think she's in just fear. terrified of. I think she's just terrified of driving with Crockett. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't look like he can control the car either. Like the way he's driving, that's really funny. Like holding the steering wheel, like he can barely control it. So no wonder she's terrified. <laughs> Every time they come back to her, it's it looks a lot like if the car was to stop, she would just jump out. This is not the ride I want to be on. So they chase yeah. Bill all the way down. They get him cornered, and he pops out of the car. And so Gina and Trudy also – sorry, Gina and Trudy. I'm mean, going to say that a lot in this. <laughs> Crockett and Trudy hop out of the Ferrari, but uh, Bill well, – calling the bad guy Bill. He just shoots at Crockett. Misses, Crockett takes cover, and they do yell out, Miami Vice, freeze, and he fires a couple shots, misses Crockett, and Trudy takes aim, fires off four perfectly aimed shots, and drops the bad guy right there in the street. Saving Crockett, too, by the way. Because it turns out she knows how to be a policewoman after all. <laughs> Even after <laughs> in the prodigal son where they run in and there's shootings and they just turn to Trudy and go, get help. <laughs> it turns out it would be better if she yes. was there. <laughs> that would have been hilarious that Crockett stops the car and yells at Trudy go get help girl <laughs> <laughs> no instead she goes all uh, uh, she goes all secret agent like superhero and, and lit takes out the bad guy You could, at the end of this scene though you see Crockett he like slowly looks at her then he walks over to the bad guy laying in the street she asks if he's dead and Crockett confirms that and you can see on both sides both of them are like i can't believe that just happened and not that that, that they had to shoot a bad guy because crockett does that every day that's just part of his mo that's how do you think he gets ferraris yeah, all these white suits three and... people but yeah he's probably already killed three people today <laughs> yeah <laughs> but all the shock is on trudy shooting someone and she's even surprised too it's something that lo it looks like she takes personally unlike the rest of the vice team hey they've killed so many people yeah, by actually... now they can't take them all personally <laughs> You know, and I get the feeling in this episode they make it out like it's supposed to be like her first kill, like the first person she's ever killed, which I don't believe for even a minute. With all the shootouts they've been in, there's no way this is the first time she's hit something. <laughs> they do, they do a bunch of them, right? Just so far in season two, we had last week where the entire vice team was there, the shot from one boathouse to the other boathouse, killing a bunch of people there. And then mm -hmm. in the prodigal son, we had the entire vice team at the airplane sting where they were going to go bust and go get the, the, the drug score from Columbia. And all the vice team was there too. So is she just pretending to shoot? She's just over there like bang, 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 bang. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in that's just the last two episodes, so I'm a little surprised by this angle, but uh, the important thing is the cover's not blown. Y you know, uh, Crockett tell uh, is telling Castillo that yeah, the cover's not blown, you know, they're surrounded by cops and ambulances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the very next scene, when we come back from the opening credits, Tubbs and Crockett are telling Castillo, it's like, there was a routine buy. They didn't expect this stuff to happen, but their cover wasn't blown, so they'll be able to set up an, another sting. Castillo, of course, says that the that internal affairs will want to investigate. The V team and Gina are consoling Trudy, and Crockett actually does something ki ki kind of cool. He stops, comes up to her, and says, "Like, hey, thanks for protecting me, partner." Which 
it felt i don't know i can't pinpoint how i felt about that like it's supposed to be cool that you said that right like because they work together but it kind of felt condescending right it, or am i the only one that felt that way you're the only one that felt that <laughs> It was heartfelt. Okay. He went out of his way. I was touched by that moment. <laughs> he meant it. And he meant it so much that he's going to spend the next three scenes with Trudy without a shirt on. Just to Yes, it. exactly. <laughs> Having her rub his back. Okay. He's sacrificing for that. <laughs> After we leave the, this this site you know where the shooting has happened in the precinct and so we have this opening it's a great opening section by the way of uh because we finally get to see the side of the work side of trudy knowing that like she is a good cop and all the other police officers know that she's a good cop that's, that's what my affirmation is from here but then we get we get just de- don't trust her with a gun but now we're going to get deep into trudy's world stuff that we have never seen before after we leave from the crime scene we go over to trudy's place and of course trudy said she killed someone today and it's raining and she's in that little teeny tiny apartment you know she's just reflecting on her life like man you know i could do anything else and probably make more money than being a stupid ass vice cop i'm the only one that can work that damn computer <laughs> she's the only one that knows how to file paperwork too <laughs> She picks up the this, phone. This what she goes to blow off steam. Oh, I, I'm sorry. You're right. She she calls first. She you she know. thinks about um, calling, but, yeah, but instead goes, of calling, she goes over to the club. Which I mean brings us to our first music video. Um, <laughs> we get to watch Cleveland Derricks singing "Love Is for Sale." So apparently, uh, all the other clubs were busy, so she went to this one. <laughs> I love that. I love this band. I love the way this band looks. I know, John, you have a lot of information about this about these bands when we get to the music segment, so I won't get too deep into that. I just I want to say the that guy on keyboard, he looks yeah. so awkward. I just love. I love this band because they nailed every '80s band stereotype with each person. There's one person in animal print with a headband. There's one guy in a blue suit with sunglasses on. Mm-hmm. There's another guy in puffy pants and a puffy shirt playing the guitar. You know, like they, they kind of hit every '80s trope of music all in one band. It's yes, almost as if they were trying to make them look like a band. But they were really just actors playing a band. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> so then in the middle of a song, the lead singer just walks off the stage and goes to talk to Trudy. <laughs> He's done. He doesn't need to be there anymore. They can finish out the it's song. It's not without that him. busy. The holiday is not even fully booked. <laughs> the buffet's going on, that's why. They've all left to go get the food. <laughs> You can hear the music still playing when he comes walking over, and you get the sense right away that they know each other, though. They they have a history at this point. She was crying listening to the music, too. So he comes over and starts laying it on really thick. Like, at first, I was like, what's going on here? The lead singer just see, like, some vulnerable woman out in the crowd decided, <laughs> like, I'm going to go take advantage of this shit right now. But no, you get the point that they have a history, especially when, in my favorite exchange here, <laughs> she asks him how he's been. And he's like, mostly good. There's some songs I don't play anymore. And he's just looking at her. And she looks back at him. It's like, there are some songs I don't listen to either. Like, fucking Trudy. (laughs) It's a fucking burn and a half. (laughs) (laughs) Like, words hurt too, Trudy. Okay? (laughs) Not just guns. Words hurt. Look at that, man. Trudy's trying to make Billy Ocean cry. (laughs) (laughs) Off to the side, you see Adonis is listening, and Adonis is played by Giancarlo Esposito, who we have seen before in a previous episode. He played Ricky in No One Lives Forever. So he was one of those dumbass kids that was like reading comic books and and uh, squirting ketchup on the on tables at restaurants and stuff like that. Yeah, he also know he plays Gus, uh, the character Gus in Breaking Bad, and like uh, I think it's season two through. Four, I want mm-hmm. to say. And Melissa, I think you have a really deep connection. I think what's supposed to be our next podcast when Miami Vice is over with Giancarlo Esposito. Uh, yes, NYPD Blue. He plays a, like an integral part of a, it's like a two part episode with Jimmy Smith, and he is like his snitch. I guess that's what you would say. And he helps him arrest like these this this mob family, this huge mob family. And in the episode, these really poor cops, basically, these bad cops, they rat him out and he ends up getting murdered. Mm. And it's like this huge episode and Jimmy Smith is angry and it's like, I mean, I bawled through that whole episode pretty much. So. <laughs> it was so sad. He, he was actually 
he he was actually a main character in another NBC show about basically the world loses elect electricity and i can't remember the name of the day of the show but it only lasted one season i just i just so. want to take a moment and recognize that no matter how well we think we know a show if it's ever a cop show melissa's just got it like hand over <laughs> fist we can't even compete with the knowledge on cop shows i like cop I know, shows she had the whole breakdown of the plot and, <laughs> and jimmy smith said this <laughs> Hey, I love Jimmy Smith, okay? Apparently, I must like cops because, you know, my affinity for Don Johnson and then Jimmy Smith. I mean, I even like Dennis Franz, and he's fat, so. <laughs> Adonis, he's off to the side. He's listening in. He hears David. David Jones is the name of the lead singer who's also Trudy's ex boyfriend or future boyfriend in the case of this episode, too. I like Clavon better. <laughs> You can just say they bone down. It's okay. We know how that's how they well, know each other. <laughs> well, first, though, Adonis oh, yeah. comes over. He hears our conversation like that. David's ordering Dom Perignon, <laughs> and he's wearing in and dining her. So he comes over, and he's like, after David leaves, Adonis <laughs> is like, hey, baby, I'm glad to see you here. Do you know I sell drugs? And also, Phillips, put some champagne in this glass for me that's already got another drink in it. So <laughs> yeah, please go ahead and put some more champagne in this glass. It was like oh, half oh, full oh. of something else. Like, what did he pour in there? What was in there before? And, and is it, isn't, isn't that a bitch? You know, Trudy goes out of her way to get away from work, and work comes to her. Yeah, she's like laying down like, I'm a heavyweight. You can buy whatever, but she is not listening. She is all about David. Does, <laughs> does none of Trudy's friends know that she's a cop, or do they just not care? I guess not. Well, I, I guess, guess yeah. David knew, but but I mean, he. I, well, I can't get David over friends with. Yes, um, that's what I can't get past. Is that she said like that's the first time she's ever met Adonis, right? Mm -hmm. But later on in the show, they talk about how David and Adonis are like really good friends and they've grown up together. So how is that the first time yeah. she's ever met him? If he's hanging around a, like David's band and stuff. That makes no sense. David's a pretty crappy friend. He doesn't tell Adonis, like, hey, you're trying to sell coke to a cop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, no one ever tells, like, he never fills him in, like, hey, that's my cop girlfriend. <laughs> like, um, oh, well, I just tried to sell her some crack. So, <laughs> bad on me. She wants nothing to do with Adonis. She's just staring down David. And the next thing we know, we're over at David's place and they are boning down. Well, they just got done boning down, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and you know apparently when you bone down you lay your clothes out flat like you took them off like mm -hmm. my socks are here and then my pants are here and then my shirt's here it's like it's like there was a person there and they just vanished and the clothes were left there it's so that Tr when you Trudy's go very organized <laughs> <laughs> so that when you get out of bed you can get dressed in the order that you took them off but you have to start backwards so when you're going to the bed you have to take your socks off first and then your <laughs> pants then your shirt in your underwear, right? You know, like you got to go backwards. And Trudy just says, I didn't want to be alone tonight and I've had a really bad day. You were the first person I could think of and I'm tired of being alone. And he's like, why did we ever break up to begin with? They are clearly, it, this isn't just, I'm lonely. Let me hit up one of my ex-boyfriends. This is definitely like, today was a bad day. Got me thinking about you and we should get back together. Yeah. And he was like, I've been waiting for you to call me and tell me that basically. Like, yeah. I've been with other girls yeah, and nothing's and I mattered. Bet you and... Next week, he's going to be promising that he's going to make it big. Just watch, baby. One of these days, we're going to make it big. <laughs> the band's going to make it. Can I borrow $20? <laughs> <laughs> now we go to, so Trudy's in a rough spot, right? She's she's reached out to an ex-boyfriend. She's she shot, killed somebody. She's going to be investigated by internal affairs. We're just, Trudy's just in a bad spot. But we're going to come to my favorite, the next two scenes are my favorite two scenes in the entire episode. The next morning, we see Sonny, and he's over at the Imperial Hotel, and he is trying to hustle some old people at carts. So and hold on, hold on. First let's first let's talk about the important part of the scene. The two bikini girls the scene starts with. I think every <laughs> scene should start with two girls in bikinis just randomly for no reason. Like that way we just we know it's in Miami. Yeah, I agree. I agree. They they do a good job of making sure that the bikinis are out there and, and you know if they want to get those ratings up, those are rookie numbers. You gotta pump those ratings up. You gotta get some bikinis out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just saying like it, the show could have made it more than five seasons if they just started every scene with girls in bikinis. I love this scene because it's not only do you see like something funny, but it's also makes no sense. 
It makes no sense what's <laughs> happening here. Crockett is playing gin against some old people at the Imperial Hotel, and it looks like he's trying to hustle them. And I'm thinking, like, what's next? Is he doing like driveway scams or like roofing scams on these people when he's got when he's got extra time? He's already stealing cars out of the police lockup. Now he's grifting old pe- old retirees in Miami. For the record, well, he did not steal not- a car. He took back his own car. <laughs> well, apparently he's not too good at it. No. He's getting his butt kicked playing gin. And he better watch it. This guy's just got a new hip. He might lose the shuffleboard tournament coming up. <laughs> he doesn't stay sharp. Well, yeah. A woman comes out and says he's got a phone call. You realize then that it's not Sonny grifting old people. The old people are totally catfishing him the entire time. Yeah, they're like, oh, he's a nice boy, oh, yeah. but he's not that bright. <laughs> <laughs> he's not good at cards. He's a nice boy, but he's stupid. So, I have so many questions. So I think this falls in line, John, with what you were saying last week, where Vice likes to have something funny happen right before something really serious happens, and that's what this is supposed to be. What is happening here? Why is Sonny playing cards with these old folks? Why is he getting phone calls there? Is this what he does in his free time? Is he, is he – what is going on here? I think they're just trying to show you that that's what he does. Like he does that in his free time. He hangs out there and like with these old people and they all know him and he takes his calls there. So, I mean, mm-hmm. so, so obviously the, the police station knows he's there. Yeah. And so when he doesn't have – like he has downtime, he's just there hanging out with these people. You'll see it like later on in the show. He's also at like – um, I don't know what they – what – kind of i think it's like cuban coffee or something and they have them in the little shots i was waiting mm. but he that's where he i he'll, was waiting he'll for be, you to say like he he likes to knit or something <laughs> no, that would be funny <laughs> hey you'll, you'll see him too like at these little like cuban coffee bar places and the owners will know his name mm-hmm. and it'll be like marty and tell will meet him there and they'll be like oh and some soul will be like oh here you go sonny you know it's like he, it's like trying to show that he knows everybody in miami i think like mm-hmm. he's got these little places where mm-hmm. he goes and he hangs out and he's like one with the people you know like he really cares about the people so he knows them all <laughs> it's like i don't know mm. <laughs> this seems like it's another way to pump ratings up like look old people there's something here for you too where you can see some men <laughs> playing cards and they're hustling the young guy like what and else there's do you girls want? in bikinis <laughs> 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 the call is to head over to, to the precinct, and this is this is great. This is what I've been waiting for. John, this is what both of us have been waiting for all of season one. It's the internal affairs interview where they're going to talk to Trudy and Crockett about what happened. In this room, there's two IA officers, and then Crockett and Trudy. And IA says 90% of the cops don't discharge their weapons, and they go about their business every day like nothing ever happened. And then go right for the jugular on Crockett. Like, but not this cowboy, not this John Wayne. How many people have you killed so far? How many times have we talked to you? They go right after him. And it's like, finally, yes, okay, we get confirmation. Eternal Affairs does investigate somebody. Unfairly. But they can't catch Crockett. I I love Crockett's attitude. Like, this isn't even the um, most questionable kill we've had this week. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there was that one yesterday. That was pretty questionable. <laughs> that old lady walking across the street we shot. The guy we shot in the drive through <laughs> Yeah. yeah that like, guy look. was just holding a soda. <laughs> yeah. Croc is like, look, this is meeting almost over because I got a 10 o'clock with Castillo. Then I'm back with you guys at 11. So can we get this thing done? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I love that like like they just massacre people all the way up to this point, but Trudy kills one person, and it's called the the district attorney. Yeah, and and so Crockett's like we, and of course, and Trudy's saying the same thing. Like we didn't do anything wrong. I had no choice. We, we announced that we were cops. He fired first, and then we and then I fired back. Fired four shots, all four hits. Crockett's like, yeah, see, like no stray bullets, no nothing. Shoot to kill. That's how we roll in Miami Vice. <laughs> I like how that's supposed to be better, right? That, that's your defense. <laughs> Dropping like, bodies. She meant to shoot him and kill him. She didn't mean to wound him. No. Yeah. But IA does have a point. It's like backup was seconds away. How come you couldn't just hold him there? Then maybe once he saw the flashing lights, he would give up. You wouldn't have to shoot and kill somebody. Well, yeah, because what they're trying to say is that maybe he didn't know you were cops because you were dressed like a hooker and mm-hmm. you look like a drug dealer, which was, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, I won't even get into that slut shaming they were doing on that one. But <laughs> <laughs> but what I love about this is that where does it say in the police manual that you have to notify someone that you're a cop before you shoot them? 
<laughs> well, apparently they Crockett missed that part of the police manual because he never notifies anybody. <laughs> he just shoots. <laughs> Trudy is mad at Crockett. You guys argue on your own time. Can I just get mine done? Crockett storms out and just leaves Tr- Trudy there all alone. But IA just goes, it was like everything was going to be fine. And then they saw Sonny come walking into the room. And they're like, we're going to make Trudy pay because of you, Sonny. Yeah, they were definitely taking it out on her that they don't like Sonny. Yeah, absolutely. they're jealous. <laughs> <laughs> and so when they leave from I the just priest. I think they picked a hell of a time to get, to get all upset about it. Crockett's killed. Crockett killed an entire town. <laughs> yeah. He was not alone when he did that. You guys keep saying Crockett did it. Where was he by himself? Where was Tubbs? Tubbs well, was no. there too. <laughs> yeah, Tubbs was actually was definitely Tubbs there. Helped. But remember, he Tubbs, people too. Tubbs spent the whole time wrestling with that one guy when he chased him down the beach. That's because Tubbs can't wrestle people. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving from the precinct and the driving, we have just a brief driving scene where Trudy starts to question herself and Crockett's like, no, that's how cops get killed. You don't question yourself. You didn't do anything wrong. And of course, that's Crockett's style. Shoot first, ask questions later. (laughs) That's why he has a kid that he doesn't see, right? (laughs) (laughs) Then we have this weird jump. They were Mm -hmm. at the precinct. I guess maybe they weren't at the precinct. Maybe they were at the IA offices. Yeah, they were supposed to be on like headquarters or something like internal affairs headquarters or something. And then they drive to the precinct, so, and then and then we get to the precinct, and Trudy is wearing different clothes than when they left. And we find out later, like, okay, it's because she's working the streets, too. Did she change in the car? Yeah, so once again, Trudy, hotter than I remember, <laughs> apparently she's undercover as a pussycat. <laughs> and she's going to meet her. Josie and the other pussycats. <laughs> and I, I was just curious, like, like, like Dominic, but like what you're saying, like, it, does she just dress this way for work, or is it casual Friday? Like <laughs> it's um, Hooker Friday. Get it straight. Just seems strange that she's dressed like a. It's also interesting so, in this and, episode and, and, that they and, have and, her uh, dress uh, and like a bunch of different pop culture icons from the eighties. Right? She's Gina's always static. She always pretty much wears the same clothes all the time. Few variations, but Trudy's are always like big wild swings in what she's wearing. In this episode, they're really heavy on like like she's dressed like Tina Turner in this scene. And later, it's like, here's another 80s trope that she's dressed like. And what Castillo was talking to her about, saying that he wants to pull her off cases, that this, you know, she needs some time to go reflect and to, and then come back con- being, concentrating on being a police officer and work through what just happened. And she's like, absolutely not. There's no way I will leave. I'm still working. I'll, you can't do this to me. Yeah, she's offended. She like asks, like, who told you about this? You know, like, what? Is someone complaining about me or something about my work? And he's like, no, I'm just worried about you, basically. And what they're doing, the next scene is when she, she leaves Castillo, then the next scene we see Gina and Trudy walking down the street and they're still talking about what happened. And this is a very weird scene, right? A man pulls up. He says that he will pay them $50. Guy rolls up, rolls down the window, and asks what basically goes, Hey, what can I get for $10? <laughs> I got 50 cents and a lollipop. What can I get? <laughs> he points to the back seat. He's like, How about $60? I don't and you have sex with each of these. Too. Like, no, 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 no. Very wrong. He stays at the $50. That's what I'm saying. He's a hell of a bargainer. Because he's like, How much? So $50, you have sex with the two kids in the back seat. I'll give you 60 if you let me watch. And it got, man, it got so weird so fast. It got so uncomfortable. In that, yeah, that was not like even, I don't know, that was creepy. That was really creepy. <laughs> yeah, and of course, the ladies are like, yeah, go ahead and pull around in the corner. And then they bust out their badges and like, you're under arrest. And Trudy kind of roughs them up a little bit. And Gina steps in. It's like, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing? But it seems a lot less roughing up than what the men do. Yeah, she's doing it because he's a pervert. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> so yeah. for all you kids out there, for all you kids out there, for all you kids out there, don't pick up prostitutes in front of the police station. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> Go around the back. No, I'm just <laughs> that night trudy is hanging out with david again and they're going to go to a party we have a brief scene at her place where he shows her in the dress they kind of have an exchange of we we should just stay home but they decide to go out to the party and one of my favorite things from this episode is the background they head to the party it's a boat it's like a yacht party right 
And so far, we had the bar scene, and now we have this scene, then we're going to have another club scene, so on and so forth. There's a bunch of those. The background people are amazing in this episode. The guy with the giant hat and his little half shirt rolled up, <laughs> the singer guy. <laughs> and this so, this segment where they're playing the song goes so on I just want to point forever. out, Trudy is in yet, I just want to point out that Trudy is in yet another outfit looking good. And then, yeah, we get another music video that just goes on and on. And on, I don't care who the king of Babylon is. <laughs> Does Babylon even have a king? I mean, come on. <laughs> Trudy's looking around the party and there's, I mean, literally everyone is doing drugs, right? It even looks like they're doing drugs out of like Capri Suns or some shit. <laughs> like it's out of control. The bartender is dealing. Everyone's doing drugs. And Trudy's like caught in like an after school special. She tells well, My favorite part is so Trudy goes and she, she runs into Adondis, who is basically about to rough, rough up a white kid for trying to use a check to buy coke. <laughs> I didn't realize that's how you wanted to pay. You wanted to pay with the check. Yeah, so everyone can track you back to it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I thought, I, yeah, that's and the Don is all pissed. Like, no, you know, you you bring cash. But and, and just before Hardcore this, poor drug drug dealers, you know. <laughs> just before this, Trudy tells David, like, I see all this stuff. I want to bust some people, and he's he says, look, these people trust me. If you don't want to be here, this is what they do. If you want to be here, let's just leave. And so she's like, yeah, let's just get out of here. Dave is kind of disappointed, but he understands. And that's when she runs into Adonis and sees that whole scene. And she watches it. And then David comes up and they leave. So, John, you're right er, with what you said earlier. Like, she cannot avoid being a comp, right? This drug dealer just let, just not just landed in her lap, like continually slaps her in the face to remind her that he's a drug dealer, right? Yeah, I, you know, and uh, it's just, you know, it's funny uh, that no matter how she tries, she, she just, she's surrounded by drugs at work. She's surrounded by drugs. And now in her personal life, she's surrounded by drugs. Even though she, she even tried to ignore it er, er, earlier in the episode, but it just keeps, just keeps coming back. And so now it feels like she has no choice. And that's what we see in the next morning. She's over at Crockett's boat asking him for advice. This is where I was. This is what I saw. What should I do? I don't know if he's the best one to give advice about being friends with criminals. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure he just, I'm pretty sure he slept with all of his friends that are criminals. <laughs> he also says, and Melissa, you were talking about this, like he basically admits that he hangs out with drug dealers. Yeah, that's basically what he's saying. He goes, yeah, it's, it, it happens all the time, basically. <laughs> like it's, that's the life of a cop and you know, you, knowing when you're too far over the edge with your friends and stuff like that. So basically, he's just saying, like, he has friends that do drugs or party and drink and do all that. And he just ignores it. I think that that was the gist of what I got of that conversation. Yeah, And he eventually settles on, like, do you want some backup with this? Do you want us to come help you? And she agrees. But my bigger question in this is that she spends, like, the first minute of this scene giving Crockett a back rub who's sitting there with no shirt on and his pants unbuttoned, too. So what did we come into before all this? Crockett relaxing on his boat without a shirt on. Elvis <laughs> <laughs> must have ate all of his clothes again. <laughs> <laughs> Our next stop is at the precinct, and the whole vice team is together. So she agrees so she needs help, so they go to the precinct, bring in the B team and Gina, and they start talking about what she's seen so far. They ask, also ask her what her relationship is with David, because Ness was the most intriguing about this whole deal when she finally decides to bring in the vice team is that they seriously consider not making a move because it might hurt Trudy. Yeah, they're like, yeah. you don't have to do we this wanna, if you don't want we'll, to. We'll arrest drug dealers unless it conflicts with our own personal relationships. Because <laughs> they, they were truly asking, like, what is your relationship with them? How much do you care about them? And then they ask her, do you want to proceed? Like, we will just ignore that any of this no, so that I you think can... I think what they were trying to say, like, is that, that they would proceed without her. She didn't have to be involved mm. in it. That if she wanted to, like, yeah, just I, hand it over right. and give it to them, they would right, investigate it and do all this stuff and then bring her into it. Yeah, so, a little bit later, they mm -hmm. have that scene with Castillo where he tells her that, tells Trudy that she's done enough and that they can do the rest. Yeah, so that's what I think. I think they were never going to ignore it. That They just meant, like, you can pass it on to us. We'll do all the legwork and do all that. You can help us. You know, we just won't bring you into it. Like, we won't say that you're involved in it at all. But there's no way that they can do that, right? Because even no, if they make a bust without her, they're still going to put it together. Like, you work for Vice. Yeah, but I mean, I think they just mean like that she wouldn't have been the go-between, right? Where she's the one that set mm -hmm. it up. 
Mm -hmm. It would have just been like, hey, this person, like, I mean, they've done it a lot, right? Where they reach out, have Crockett wait in the bar and watch Adonis try and sell drugs for like five minutes, right? (laughs) And then he could just walk up to him like organically and say, hey, I see you're doing that. I want to buy some, you know, like that's what they meant. Like, Mm -hmm. and that's what they were doing, like, like, you know, doing research on it and stuff like that. But they meant like, it's not, we're going to ignore it. We're just not going to have you involved in it. We just won't let the, let anyone know you're involved in it. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't mess with you and David. Uh, Yeah. I mean, I, I understand all of that, I and Trudy obviously sticks to it. Like she wants to be involved the entire time. It's her call and it's her connection on how they're going to bring it down. Um, but you, I can totally understand from her perspective because it puts her in a tough spot with David too. Where if they make this bust, it might not just ruin their relationship, David and Trudy's relationship. It might ruin his relationships wherever his band is allowed to play, right? Because those are his. It's like it's his best friend that they would bring down and then whoever he's connected with and what clubs they can play at. Yeah. So it was definitely going to have like a, a, an effect on everything if they did it. So mm-hmm. that's why they were trying to make sure that so she wanted to be. That's the truth. He never made it. <laughs> <laughs> Not because he wasn't talented. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I like how the team goes about this because as soon as they're done talking to Trudy about it, she leaves and tubs follows her to homeboy's house. So I love how the vice team is uh, immediately is suspicious of her boyfriend, like, as soon as it starts. Yeah, oh, she's yeah. out of the room. Now, Taylor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tubbs, Taylor's Adonis, and he, he overhears a conversation with that he's who he's buying from that he's in over his head. He's trying, he can't come through with enough money for based on how much he wants to sell, and they want cash only from him nothing on they won't give him drugs to sell he has to buy them from buy the drugs from them we also have a quick stop at trudy's where david says like hey sorry about adonis i have other friends i can hang out with we're close but we're not as close as we used to be so sorry about tonight the next day at the precinct tubbs is showing crockett all the stuff he found out about adonis which turns out tubbs can actually use a computer right (laughs) <laughs> yeah he's just lazy and has trudy do it all for him <laughs> well he can't he can't yeah, have her investigate herself <laughs> clam juice is getting me involved in everything now oh god no no clam juice oh, yeah. that's disgusting he finds out that he, he says immediately like good news is david is clean like okay thanks for looking into him i didn't ask you to do that but <laughs> bad news is he's a terrible musician <laughs> <laughs> The bad news is, is that he's got four kids in my aunt, uh, uh, yeah, in, yeah, exactly. in Utah. <laughs> but he does say that Adonis is well connected. He's linked up with the Ramon Lopez de Hoya, and who's a Colombian. And because we can't get through an episode without having a Colombian involved. They're connected if they won't front him drugs. <laughs> yeah, I know. They ask Trudy again, like, are you sure you want to move forward because they're close friends? But this would be a huge bust. And they give trudy a chance to say if she wants to be involved and she wants to say right away like yes i want to be involved but gina like forces her like no go think about this beforehand go walk slowly down the the road thinking about it montage (laughs) (laughs) yes now i love this montage she walks around the reason i love this montage is because we get a full song because you know this episode was kind of light on content and so we have three sections where you play whole songs through the episode mm-hmm. then we also get a great overlay of everything that's happened in the episode so far in case it was so slow you forgot what happened earlier in the earlier in the episode or you left the room or something and you weren't paying attention <laughs> well you don't have to just sit through that montage last time on Miami Vice <laughs> <laughs> what's funny is they used to do that too like when it was on when it would air originally they would be like last time on miami vice (laughs) well they didn't need to do anything for this episode they could just cut this section out and run it before (laughs) exactly (laughs) i hope they use this montage every time trudy has to think about something (laughs) like hey trudy you going out to the bar tonight they play the montage of her walking (laughs) no guys i don't think i'm coming She decides, it's clear that she decides at the at the end of that that she's good that she's gonna be the one to lead the bus because we go over back to the club where David's band is playing again. And this time Trudy's there to talk specifically to Adonis. And she tells him, I have a guy who has a yacht in the marina. He wants to buy three keys. And this is what I finally put together. It's like Adonis doesn't know, know she's a cop. <laughs> yeah, I know a guy with a boat. That's Crockett's only usefulness. I, I'm a guy with a boat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they immediately go over to Crockett's boat. And 
they i mean adonis is a little not i don't want to say gun shy what's the word i'm looking for it's the apprehensive opposite of, yeah he's he's apprehensive of crockett but he really he wants to make that size of a sale right because it's like a hundred thousand dollars for three keys isn't that what crockett says it feels a little yes. bit like a set i mean it helps that crockett has a shirt on <laughs> uh, and he didn't just fall out of the cabbage truck <laughs> Adonis so says at one that, point I was hoping he was going to ask ask him if he took a check. So, <laughs> yeah, um, but money I love order. At the end, at the very end, he's like, "All right, cool, dude." <laughs> the not cool, man. <laughs> not cool. <laughs> the conversation so apparently police works pretty easy with, with, when the criminals don't notice anything. That probably jump out to them as, "Hey, this feels like a setup." Uh, yeah, our friend that. Told me about it's a cop. Like that should. Well, apparently he doesn't know she's a cop, though, right? He doesn't know she's a cop. It's still suspicious, though, right? Because he's like, I've only talked to you a couple times. Now you know a guy that wants to buy a hundred thousand dollars worth of cocaine on his boat. And also, he keeps calling Crockett her boyfriend. He's like, "Oh, you know your boyfriend," but she has a boyfriend, right? So isn't he David's friend? So he doesn't care that David is dating someone who, and he thinks she's like sleeping with Crockett too. Like that isn't ever like some kind of friend he is. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, why I'm is David protecting him? I'm just saying, this case is going pretty easy. I mean, they're pretty much just walking into everything that they're laying out for him. Yeah, the, Adonis just walks right into it. He wants the money up front, but Crockett talks about the money up front. Getting the money up front, they decide that Trudy's going to set up the meat. Adonis is going to go get the drugs, and then they'll make the sale. We have a brief stop over at the De Hoyas, where you see like the Hoyas really don't want to do business with him. He's in over his head. This is something that they don't trust him with. Basically, he doesn't have the credit with them in, in order to get three keys to, to make this deal. We have another brief stop over at the precinct where everyone's together to discuss how they're going to do the bus. They're going to do it at the club. They decide on who's going to do what. They he remind Cassie reminds Scrooter like just because this is routine, make sure everyone's doing their they're staying sharp. And then, but what's important here is that before they leave, Castillo tells Trudy like, "And I want you out." I want you off this. This isn't your deal. You should take your... She says you want some time off. It's like, you should take it now that he's really concerned with her that because of everything that's been happening. And it's everything points to like, yeah, Crockett Crockett tattled on her. (laughs) Yeah, she said, who told you that, Crockett? (laughs) It's funny because I... I, Watching Castillo in this scene, I was just thinking like, man, Castillo just does not like conflict. Like, he won't look at her for the whole first part of the whole scene. He's like looking away, like won't Mm -hmm. look her in the eyes. And then at the end, he's like, no, no, no. I just... We can handle it if you want, you know? Like, totally backs off. But like, when he first tells her, like, get out of here and take your days off, like, he won't even look at her. The only frustrating part here is that, and you totally understand Trudy, it's like, get out of my way and let me do my job, right? I'm a cop, let me do my job. So now we go to the last scene of the episode where we're going to make the bust. They're finally going to bring down Adonis. We've come full circle, and we're going to bring down Adonis, this this dealer that just fell right into her lap. Not suspicious at all. (laughs) (laughs) Again, don't think anything of it. So I love Crockett comes in and does his little professional coke test (laughs) vial. Yeah. You know, like the cops use. (laughs) (laughs) But he's not a cop, though, so don't think about it. Well, he's not a cop. You know what, though? I get the sense, you get the sense, though, in this last scene because of how Adonis is acting. Like he didn't have enough money to buy all the drugs, so he's cutting it with some, like, baby powder or yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's what it is. So you also get the p- point that Adonis isn't exactly the smartest guy either. Uh, no, he's not very bright at all. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for him. And I'm so, and, and what, even more than that, I'm surprised that he's surprised that they're cops <laughs> at this point. Like, <laughs> Like, he acts all surprised. It's like, really? Really, dude? Like, you did not see this coming at all. Uh, yeah, Trudy pulls it. As soon as he says he wants to make the deal, Trudy pulls the gun, says vice, and then he slams Crockett in the face with the tray. A, a lot of coke. Crockett's going to be up for a long time after getting hit in the, get hit in the face with that tray. And he's going to smell baby fresh, too, because it had a lot of baby powder in there. <laughs> he will not be sweaty tonight. <laughs> then Adonis starts stalking towards Trudy, and she hesitates. She does exactly what Crockett said was the problem with these IA investigations. Oh, sorry, and I missed I missed it. At the, the last scene at the precinct, Castillo tells 
Crockett and Trudy that they've been they're fine with with IA they they're not going to pursue charges. But Adonis starts walking up and she's like, "Stop or I'll shoot! Stop or I'll shoot!" And she hesitates. She hesitates so long, in fact, that by the time Crockett comes over and punches Adonis to knock him out, she could have shot Crockett because she waited so long. And why do you sound disappointed in that? <laughs> she could have shot Crockett. <laughs> and of course. The very last thing that we see in this episode is that David shows up after the bus has come in. The, the rest of the vice team have come into the room. They're arresting Adonis. And David's like, what the hell's going on in here? Crockett tries to talk to David. And Trudy says, get out of here. I got this. And she tells David, like, look, I'm a cop. It's not a job. It's a lifestyle. This is the way that I am. Adonis couldn't be trusted. And David's really hurt. He's like, I can't believe you would do this. And I trusted I'm you. I'm going to cut through. I'm going to cut through all the bullshit. Everything David is saying, he's basically saying, you just heard my Coke dealer and now no <laughs> one's going to like me. <laughs> yeah, he's such a jerk. He's being a jerk, seriously. He's going on and on about how she's like a snake and she's like evil and you can't trust her. And Like you knew she was a cop. Then why did you bring her to all these parties where there was drugs? I don't know. Knew? I kind of side with David because <laughs> you would you think. You would. <laughs> He's gonna write one hell of a song about this, and we'll all forget. <laughs> you would. No, I'm just kidding. All those times I was a cop, and you didn't side with me. <laughs> <laughs> I just I understand where David's coming from. Not that his friend got arrested. It's like you know, he had a lot at stake in this too. Maybe he would like to have some input in on her decisions, right? Yeah, but if what she told him that she was a- stops hiring him. <laughs> But if she told uh, him that she was investigating like his friend, a whole lot of gigs. yeah, exactly. <laughs> if she told him she was investigating his friend, he might have told his friend. So she can't jeopardize that, like, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it doesn't. Isn't she supposed to? If she's a cop like everybody else, that you guys have been wanting her to to finally show she's a real cop, then she has to take her job serious, right? Mm-hmm. She can't just be like, oh, my boyfriend doesn't want me to do this, because that would be something that Crockett and Tubbs would never do that. They could never, mm-hmm. no woman would ever tell them, hey, you can't arrest this person or I don't want you to investigate this. And they would be like, okay, sure, I won't do it. So she's doing what she's supposed to do. Well, she's granted, being a cop. <laughs> granted, Tubbs did sleep with the daughter of a drug dealer and Tubbs did try and nail the wife of another. Uh, <laughs> and he also did sleep with a woman who murdered somebody in the Great McCarthy race, but we're not talking about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> why are we throwing stones? I, I, I mean, stone come on now, really, why are we? Different situations. <laughs> <laughs> but what i'm saying is if you guys wanted her you guys have been complaining right for like an entire season about how she she doesn't get treated like a real cop right like oh she's doing the, she's mm-hmm. like a secretary then she's being a real cop she's putting her job first that's it true her, her boyfriend love, because your more, boyfriend more, doesn't more, like it she, you don't just go like i'm gonna quit my job because my boyfriend doesn't like me being a cop like that's mm-hmm. what you're supposed to do <laughs> I love that's Trudy. true i want to see more trudy in fact the only thing i like more than trudy the cop is trudy the pussycat <laughs> I did not think he was going to add the cat part at the end, and I was like, "Holy crap!" <laughs> well, that sums up the episode. Our our full standalone Trudy episode. We have a lot to, of music to talk about, so let's get over and talk about the music. All right, John. I know you got a lot to talk about in this, so let's see. Let's see how quickly. You, you can run through a great music episode. Yeah, so we got a book. We have five songs, which is pretty good for a single uh, single episode. And we've actually got some good stuff to talk about for the most part. So we're going to just jump right in with the first song from the open of the episode entitled Woman by Foreigner. Mm, I didn't realize that's four, who was singing. Yeah, yeah. It, it was their fourth single off of their third album, Head Games. It was written by guitarist Mick Jones. It reached number 41 on the Hot 100 and just a few side notes this is the album where rick willis replaced ed gagliardi on bass it is also the last album with with members ian mcdonald and al greenwood and it's the only album to be produced by rory thomas baker of queen fame Mm. produced all queen's stuff the album head games produced songs like double vision head games and dirty white boy which is uh why it's one of their uh, more acclaimed albums. That might be one of my favorite albums of all time. Yeah, I think like when I think of Foreigner, like like that's if you look at the track listings, like that's the album I think of when I think of Foreigner music. So um, it makes sense that that, that was kind of the uh, was produced by the by 
Rory Thomas Baker, the guy who did the Queen, like that's the only album he produced of theirs because it's kind of that pinnacle album of theirs. Mm -hmm. So moving on, the next song we have is Diamond Field by Pat Benatar. This is during the opening car chase scene. Pat Benatar, man, she is really just the pinnacle of an American success story. I, I will just be first to say that. Her her actual Christian name, I, I'm not even going to try and pronounce. Um, <laughs> that her last name is some the Polish last name. Her hits include Hit Me With Your Best Shot and Love Is a Battlefield. She's a four-time Grammy winner. But what I mean by she's an American success story is uh, so she dropped out of Stony Brook College after her first year at, at the age of 19 to marry her husband Dennis Benatar. Thankfully she took his last name. Yeah. I didn't realize that was a married name. I figured that was a stage name. Yeah. Like, her actual Last name has like 32 vowels in it. <laughs> Her husband, Dennis, was actually an Army draftee and Specialist E-4 stationed at Fort Lee, Virginia for three years. And while he was stationed at Fort Lee, Virginia, Pat worked as a bank teller. So so she would work as a bank teller and eventually she would quit because she, would, she wanted to take her singing and make it a full-time job. So she got a job as a singing waitress at a restaurant called The Roaring Twenties. She worked there and worked her way onto a never aired PBS special before getting in to start playing several clubs and eventually got her big break as a rock star. So she really worked mm. her way all the way up, you know, from singing waitress to failed PBA, PBS specials all the way to four time Grammy Award winner. Wow. So our next song is Love is for Sale by Clevant Hertz. He's an actor, singer, and songwriter. We're going to get the song out of the way right, right now. So the song was never actually, was recorded exclusively for Miami Vice and did not actually ever appear on any album or single that was ever released. Mm -hmm. It was strictly for the show. I did find, while doing research, that there was a show tune called Love is for Sale that was from the 1930s by Catherine Crawford and about hookers. So, I don't know. Maybe that's what he's singing. Um, I, I just, I, I can't confirm that as fact, though. <laughs> so, but to get into to, uh, Derek's a little bit, like I say, he's an actor, singer, songwriter. He's best known for his role as Rembrandt. Rembrandt Brown on the TV show Sliders, which aired on Fox from seasons one and three on Fox, uh, one, two, three on Fox, and seasons four and five, on, it moved to the Sci-Fi Channel. Little known fact, his twin brother, Clinton Derricks Carroll, played Cliff Anderson on the TV show Sanford, <laughs> who's also an actor-musician. Derricks Rembrandt Brown character is the only character on Sliders to appear throughout the entire series. He also did guest spots in shows such as Moonlighting and Roseanne. Our next song of the episode is King of Babylon by David Johnson. He is also a musician actor, best known for his role for, for being a member of the punk band New York Dolls. Which, by the way, I've noticed a lot of the music and stuff. Whoever picks the music, whether it's the show, whether it's showrunner if, or the director uh, or something. Was, yeah, whoever was responsible for picking the music, whether it was Jan Hammer or whoever, they, they must have liked punk. Because mm -hmm. we get a lot of guys who are who are from these niche punk bands. So like David Johansson was a member of the New York Dolls. The New York Dolls were well received critically, but kind of failed commercially. Never really took off. He left the band in 1977 for a solo career. He released two albums and often born, uh, performed Dolls songs. Highlight being for when he opened for the Who that one time. <laughs> 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 so but he also had some success as a pseudonym character named buster poindexter buster poindexter was a member of saturday night lights uh, saturday night lives house band <clears throat> so and he appeared on the show singing a uh, novelty song several times <laughs> i love that that's what his role was like can you sing this song about brand flakes please not a real song no no, no. just this one about brand flakes yes 
Yes, that's what Buster Poindexter did. <laughs> and, and then he also made appearances on the TV show Adventures of Pete and Pete. Actually, in several movies, too. He started off as Hulk Hogan and Mr. Nanny. Okay, I gotta watch that movie now. Yeah, and he co-starred in Car 54, Where Are You? And King of Babylon being on his solo album, Sweet Revenge. Oh, so it is a real song. They didn't make it up just for the episode. Yes, the second music video in the episode is actually a real song by David Johansson. Mm. And the last song of the episode is Who to, Lis- uh, Who to Listen To by Amy Grant. Uh, and that's during the Trudy Thinks montage. <laughs> so that's on the album Unguarded. Amy Grant is often referred to as the Christian Queen of Pop. She spent first whole whole beginning of her career as a contemporary Christian artist. This album, Unguarded, was her her first leap into mainstream pop. The so- One of the songs off the album, the big song, Find A Way, would become the first non-Christmas Christian song to make the top 40, uh, the <laughs> Billboard's top 40 list. That is quite a seven. feat. That is quite a feat to, yes. to get out, to break out of the Christmas genre love, and be in that, the top 10. I love both the specific specificity of of that and the fact that that is the first non Christmas Christmas song. So apparently, in, in the entire history of Christian music up to that point, only Jingle Bells had made it on the <laughs> Billboard's top forty. <laughs> no actual Christian rock songs had made it up there yet. Thank you, Amy Grant, for breaking that trend. Apparently, which you know, no one co- country fans if they just replace the word Jesus with truck. I mean. You can you can turn a Christian song into a country song real easy. You would think that you would have been able to, to have. Have to take out all of the Jesus. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on there that. There you go. There you go. That that that's your music, Christian Queen of Pop and uh, Buster Poindexter. It was actually more people like more. I don't know how to phrase this. Like people who are gigantic music stars who are making the music. When I first heard the songs, I'm like, okay, this is going to be an episode of a bunch of of a bunch of no names, but no, it's actually like Amy Grant. This is one of the songs. So Amy Grant, Hat Benatar, and Foreigner, and the two, yeah. and, and the two songs they choose to perform live are by Clavant Derricks and David Johansson. Yeah. So <laughs> who needs Foreigner? We'll get <laughs> we'll get David Johansson. <laughs> well, let's go over and talk about our final thoughts this episode. You know, Melissa, I am tempted to start with you on your final thoughts, but I will kick off this week on my final <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> yeah, you stop putting me on the spot finally. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed this episode, and I was—I know we had. It felt like I'm sure it felt like we were joking all this time. Like, when, when are we going to get to a Trudy episode? When are we going to get to a Trudy episode? When's Trudy going to get her due? And like, maybe we were hinting at like because when we get there, it's gonna suck because Trudy's not much of a character. But I think for me at least, and I think John's gonna feel the same way, is that no, we wanted Trudy to get her due because we felt like there was more depth to that character than maybe what they're letting on than just letting her punch some numbers into a keyboard and file some papers away. She's a real cop and show her as a real cop, and I'm sure there's lots of stuff behind there. And this episode was great because it wasn't just her being a cop, but it was also her personal life. We got to see this wasn't like a Trudy episode where it was really a Tubbs and Crockett episode, but then the uh, the uh, the filler in between was Trudy. This was really good because it was 100% Trudy the entire time. So I thought it was really good. It was a little slow in the middle. So like that montage of her reviewing everything that happened in the episode was kind of important for me because I really needed to catch up on <laughs> things that happened earlier in the episode. But I thought it was really good. It was really heartfelt. You really got to see that the, the rest of the Vice team really care about her. They're really concerned about her because we saw that we kind of saw it in an early episode where she's attached to the bomb right and then crockett goes and saves her but you get you really see that like they respect her as a police officer in this uh, in this episode you mean the episode where they forgot that she was uh at that person's <laughs> yeah. apartment until the end of the episode when they realize oh my god Trudy might be there and they find her with a bomb strapped to her you, yeah yeah you know the episode they forgot about her <laughs> So yeah, this was good. This was this was much needed. We're, so this means we are just one character short of having a dedicated episode about them, and that's Switech. And I can't wait for Switech to get where it's just his because we've had the made for each other episode, but that was really a Zito episode, right? 
because everything was happening to Zito, and then we got a little bit of Switek in it. I want a 100% Switek episode. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Well, I agree with you in that I, I think we kept wanting to see a true episode, and, and at least for me, because I thought that we had the Gina episode, and I felt all along that Trudy's the, the, was going to be the stronger of the two characters. That that was going to be the interesting one. Because I kind of saw Trudy, uh, at least at first, as being a love interest or possible love interest that they could flirt with Crockett. And so uh, I, I was interested to see, like, Trudy, uh, I expected Trudy's character to be the one with a crazy backstory, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I was really looking forward to it. I enjoyed seeing Trudy actually be allowed to be a cop throughout this episode. I want to see more Trudy episodes, but I don't think I got enough. I, I, I guess, I don't know. I think, uh, like like you, that middle part was kind of slow, and I just, I, I was kind of hoping it was just a little bit more, a little more Miami Vice craziness, you know? Mm -hmm. Like her second cousins in a jail in Panama, you know, <laughs> some crazy <laughs> angle to work in there for future storyline. I just, mm -hmm. I really hope this isn't the last Trudy episode. I, I hope we get it more... Trudy dedicated episode. And going back to, to what you were saying with the Zwy Tech with the Made for Each Other episode, I think that was the other reason why I was so excited for the Trudy episode was that I felt like they did the Gina episode, that they did the, the Zito's Zwy Tech episode with Made for Each Other. Like everyone's had their backstory episode. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and so she was the last one, and so I felt there was all this buildup, which is another reason why I was saying like I was really hoping for something crazy. You know, Trudy has a identical twin, you know, <laughs> an evil twin who has an eye patch. Yeah, <laughs> so, but I enjoyed it. I I just hope we get more, and, and I hope for maybe something a little crazy like that next time. Yeah. Well, Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Well, like you guys, I I really like this episode. Um, I like Trudy. I don't like her as much as I like Gina, but <laughs> but I do like Trudy. <laughs> I think it was good. It was um, definitely balanced with how serious it was, you know, like with her contemplating, like maybe not being a cop anymore and what it was. Uh, and it, I think it shed some good light on what it's like to be an undercover cop and maybe to be a woman as an undercover cop, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. That, you know, they don't take you as serious. And then when you do your job, it's like, oh, my God, you did your job. It's a big deal. <laughs> are you okay you know i mean i think the men shoot people all the time and no one ever asks them if they're okay and they're not worried about them psychologically and nobody's telling them they need to take time off mm -hmm. like they're doing with her so i think it's a good um episode for that and i also like like you guys that you get to see like her outside of work and that she does have a life and that she's you know she had a love interest and you get to see what she's like when she's not also that she's not with gina the whole time too because i mean they're supposed to be best friends but that doesn't mean they spend all their hours together you know mm -hmm. i think it's good you get to see her away from all the police stuff and she is just being herself so and i will say i'm pretty sure if i remember correctly that there is an um there's more gina episodes you know where her by herself where it's focused on her and there is more trudy episodes where it's focused on her too and you do get a spy tech one eventually <laughs> mm, aww, that sounds like it's a far it's far away i'm not uh. i don't think it's in this season i mean uh, it is focused uh, on him with that episode that. um uh it's an episode where phil the shill that's okay. kind of focused on him a little bit but not in the way you want, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I that just want to know more about Switek and Elvis, like his fascination with Elvis. Let's get oh, the there's definitely, on. there's definitely going to be more stuff about Elvis. Like you would know, he will talk about Elvis and all that stuff. <laughs> that would definitely be. It just won't be like a whole. It's going to be here and there, like throughout mm. the seasons. Like here, this is this little tidbit of stuff. There's that tidbit mm -hmm. of stuff. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We had a lot of fun finally getting to the Trudy episode, even though it has a terrible name in the Dutch of it. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode be sure to check out our website go with the heat.com email us we would love to hear from you send us an email at go with the heat at gmail.com you can get us on twitter or facebook you can follow our official accounts you can follow us on individually go to our website go with the heat.com click on about us you can find all the ways you can subscribe to the show and follow us did you know what the show is on youtube it's on stitcher it's on itunes on Google Play, pretty much anywhere you want to listen to the show, we're available there. We really hope you enjoy this episode, and we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye.